Today I'm going to walk you through the Mendelian Inheritance and Chi-Square Analysis Lab from Kansas Corn Stem. So, I'm Bill Welch. I'm a, I work, uh, I'm a master teacher for uh, Kansas Corn STEM, and today I'm going to walk you through the Mendelian Inheritance and Chi-Square Analysis Lab provided by Kansas Corn STEM. So, one of the uh, purposes of the activity uh, is to get specific objectives aligned with genetics and also bringing some math into the science curriculum, which, which math is always a tool for science, okay? So objective-wise, we've got students will develop a hypothesis for genotypes of parents of a monohybrid cross and a dihybrid cross. The students will predict the outcomes using a hypothesis using knowledge of inheritance and probability. So that's going to be using a little math. Students will quantify the results of the monohybrid and dihybrid crosses and compare the results with their prediction by performing something called a chi-square analysis. So, before we get into the math part of that chi-square analysis, the first thing we want to look at is something called hypothesis testing. And in science, we use hypothesis testing a lot to, find, to, de to determine if the results we get are close enough to the expected value, or do they align with the expected value enough to be considered the same as the expected value. So, what we do in, initially in science is we set up the, the whole the, the big hypothesis we start with is called the null hypothesis. That null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference between these results I got and what the expected results are, okay? Independent of whether it's talking about corn genetics or any other thing in science. The alternative hypothesis is really what we actually are expecting, and, it's, and that is essentially say, stating that there is a significant difference between this result I got and what was actually expected. Okay, so that hypothesis testing is really a premise of this little statistic we're going to use. So the statistic we're using is something called chi-square. And chi-square is, a, is a, a means of looking at our observed results and our expected results and comparing them mathematically and coming up with what we call a chi-square number. That chi-square number is going to be something we're going to look in a chart and try to determine from that chart whether or not it's accepted as yes, this is the same statistic, there's no significant difference between my results and what's expected, okay? So in this case, when you're looking at this, uh, the example I've got here on, on, the, uh, on the screen is an example of flipping coins. You flip a coin, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting a heads or tails. Well, if you flip the coin and you got, it flipped it 100 times and you got 56 heads and 44 tails, okay? If that's the results you got, the expected result, if you flipped it 100 times, the expected result would be 50 and 50. Well, this is an example of how we would use uh, chi-square to determine uh, if, this is a, if, if this is the same thing. Is 56 to 44 the same thing as 50 to 50, okay? And that's really what this is trying to do. So to do that, we, we, we put the uh, chi-square formula together, and the chi-square formula is observed minus the expected divided by the expected. The observed divided minus the expected on the top numerator is squared because we want to eliminate the positives or negatives. We don't care if it's a negative difference or a positive difference. We just want to know, is there a difference, okay? So when we get that, we actually get the calculation on the, on, on the, uh, on the screen there. We get a value of 1.44. That's our chi-square value. Well, what does that mean? Well, we've got to look in a chi-square table to determine what that means. So, if we flip a coin, there are only two possible outcomes, heads and tails. So to determine our degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom column, the way we use that is we take the number of possibilities minus one. So if we've got two possibilities, heads and tails, and we take two minus one, we get one as the degrees of freedom. So we look under the degrees of freedom one call, uh, row, and we go across until we find our number. The number we had was 1.44. And, well, let me go back here. 1.44 falls in between this 1.07 and 1.64. That's in the data table. Uh, if you look above that, it goes and tells us to say, fails to reject the null hypothesis. So unless we get to the number over there at 0.05, so 0.05 is considered the 95th percentile, uh, which is saying that one out of 20 chance that something's 
randomly happening. If that's the case, we accept that statistically it's the same. So, in this case, if we are failing to reject the null hypothesis, we are not rejecting that there's no significant difference. We are accepting that there's no significant difference. So, in that case, this means that 56 to 44 is going to be statistically no significantly different, not significantly different than a 50 to 50 with flipping the coins. Okay? So, when we look at this data table here, this is another uh, chi-square statistic table. You'll find these in the back of, of statistics books and also in some science books. But really what we're looking for is the critical value of P05, which means that at 0.05, that level, that's our level of confidence that science for the most part uses as significant. Okay? If, you're, if your value is less than 0.05 as far as that critical value, it's considered no significant difference. Okay? And that's why at the bottom of that table, you've got the fail to reject if it's less than that value, and it's reject the null hypothesis. So if we reject the null hypothesis, we are going to say that that value is not the same statistically. Okay? So that's the statistic little talk behind this. What we're doing today is we're going to use uh, corn. Okay? And in this case, you've got an ear of corn. And this ear of corn is probably not something you'd, look like you'd find in the store that you'd be eating. But what you have here is multiple, every time a corn is essentially pollinated, each little tiny piece of corn is a specific pollination. So you've got on this head of corn, let's say there's 400 pieces of corn on that, that's 400 individual pollination events, crosses. So genetically, this is a way of looking at some genetic information and collecting some genetic information very quickly. So when you look at this, uh, You've got some yellow corn, yellow pieces, you've got some, some purple, you've got some weird colors in there that look a little different. And all, some of them are smushed down and some of them are solid and filled up. So when we look at an ear of corn like this, uh, we're going to try to look at this and see if we can pull out some of this genetic information. Okay. So what, what, when you look at this, and you'll notice these, these ears of corn that you're going to have will actually be in, enveloped in some plastic. Uh, and that's, that's to keep them together because they do fall apart uh, fairly readily when they don't have that plastic on them. If, they, if a plastic does come off, all you have to do is wrap them with saran wrap and it'll, it'll keep them together. Okay? So when you look at this, uh, which one, which, which color do you think when you're looking, just color purple versus yellow, which is more obviously, which present more obviously? Uh, when I say that, if you're going to say it's dominant, uh, which trait would you say is dominant, yellow or purple? Okay. In this case, we might even call it blue because it's actually bluish color. So, are there any colors in between those two? Well, there's there are some colors in there that are not quite the the yellow and not quite the blue. And those colors uh, look like there's some kind of mix of something in there. Okay. So we've got some observations on this this head of corn that is pretty uh, peculiar. If you look at this, if you pick this up in the store you'd be a little, a little questioning whether you want to eat it, okay? But this actually is an F2 generation. In other words, they cross specific, uh, specific uh, generations of corn, an F1 generation, with specific traits to get this, okay? So, uh, we'll use the letters B for, big B is going to be a, we'll call that a letter for the blue color. And little b is going to be the color for yellow. It's a recessive. So big B we'll call as the most, color, most prevalent color. We're going to call that dominant trait. So when we look at that, if we did that cross, um, we've got some different traits here that we're going to actually collect some data from. So what we're going to do is we're going to count 100 of those pieces of corn. Uh, and ideally, if you count them straight in rows, okay, if you, if you do this randomly, uh, it, it's ideal. But you don't want to sit there and just pick the ones you want to look at. So ideally, you're going to go straight down the rows until you get, uh, get to 100. Once you get, a, once you get to get 100, then you've collected all the data you need. And all you're asking yourself is this. Is it blue or is it yellow? Okay. If it's, if it's not blue or yellow, which color is it closer to? And then you'll count it as that color. All right. So once you do that, you're going to get something like this. Did I hit the right button there? I'm going the wrong way. Let's see. Here we go. So let's take a look at this. So if we do 100 of those, and we're expecting a 3 to 1 ratio if it's a dominant versus recessive, it's one trait, blue versus yellow, okay? And it's a single trait we're looking at. It's called a monohybrid cross. 
If we're looking for just blue or yellow, the expected would be 75 and 25 if we had 100 actual samples that we took from, okay? When we actually count this, it's, if you take a section and there's 100 pieces there and we count them, we count them as blue or yellow, we get numbers that look like this, 67 and 33. So we took a sampling from this head of corn. We now have observed values and we have expected values. Let's determine is 67 to 33, is that close enough to a three to one ratio to be accepted statistically in science? Because we don't want to say, oh, eyeball it, oh, that's pretty close, you know. We want to know statistically, and we can say with, 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 uh, with confidence as far as, what, as far as that result goes. So, chi-square analysis. So here we've got the formula, okay? The, the, the value, uh, when you look at this screen, uh, and let me highlight this real quick, this little sigma value here means summation of. So you're gonna add up all of those for the different traits if you have different traits there, okay? This is observed. This E is for expected. You're gonna take those, get the difference between them, and then square that on top. And then you're gonna divide it by the expected for what that value is, okay? So, when we go through this, you got the chi-square, sum of, you got the observed, you got the expected, and the expected on the bottom. Just don't forget, on the top, you're squaring that value. And that is because you could have a negative number up there or a positive number. We don't care if it's negative or positive, we just wanna know how far off from the expected value it was. So when we do this, when we do actually take these numbers and put, plug them into the formula, this is what we get. We're essentially taking 75 minus 67, or 67 minus 75 and squaring it. We get those values. We actually uh, reduce that to 64 over 75 and 64 over 25. Those values end up becoming, if you add those two together, 3.41. So that's our chi-square value. So we now have a, a calculated chi-square value. We're trying to determine is 67 to 33 close enough to a three to one ratio to be accepted statistically. So we're gonna have to compare our 3.41 to our data table. When we look at our data table, we've got uh, how many degrees of freedom? Well, we've got two, two things that can happen. It can be blue or yellow. So there's only two possible outcomes. So we take that two number of two outcomes minus one, and we end up having one degree of freedom. So this again, we're also gonna look here on the, the first row. The degree of freedom is gonna be one. And when we go through there, our value is 3.41. And the, the, the 0 0.05 value, this is the cut line. This is the line at 0.05. It's if it's greater, if it's this number or greater, we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. If it's less than this, we're gonna accept the null hypothesis, okay? So in this case, 3.41 is less than 3.84. So we are going to, re we are going to re reject the null hypothesis that says, that's, I'm sorry, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis that says we are going to, uh, that there's no significant difference between 67 and 33 and 75 and, and, and 25. And what we're looking at is 67 to 33, is that a three to one ratio, statistically speaking? And based on this formula and based on our results here of 3.41 and comparing that to 3.84, we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we are accepting the null hypothesis. And that terminology and statistics sometimes is confusing. So there's our, there's our cut score right, right there. So that's just color, blue and yellow, okay? There's another trait on this, this uh, ear of corn that's, pre and I don't know if it's, it's easy for you to see, but you can see some of these are kind of like, like this kernel right here is kind of squished up. It's wrinkled, and this, these, color, these ones here are filled. They're filled up, they're round, and this is kind of like a wrinkled up one, okay? Uh, since this is full of starch, we used to call these starchy, okay? And these are actually, shrunken up and shriveled, we call these sweet, okay? They don't have, they have less starch and more of the sugar in there. So what happens here is we're looking at two different traits here. We're not looking at just color of, of uh, blue versus yellow. We're now gonna look at uh, wrinkled versus a round coloration. Uh, not coloration, but structure. This is the shape of the actual kernel. So when we do this, uh, by the way, you do the same thing, the same procedure we just did for the blue and yellow you can do with this uh, wrinkled versus, uh, versus round. You count 100, 
you, you get the ratios, you, you compare the ratios to 75 to 25, which would be expected if you counted 100 of these, and you come up with your value and you compare that value uh, to 3.84 in that data table. So this would be another monohybrid cross you can get from the same ear of corn, all right? Monohybrid crosses are probably the best way to look at the, some of the statistics and introduce it, at least in the middle school level, okay? And middle school levels, looking at one trade at a time is, is very simple and easy to calculate. You don't have to worry about compounding errors as, as far as that goes, all right? Now, it just so happens that these are these ears of corn are actual dihybrid crosses, okay? And dihybrid means we're looking at more than one trait, we're looking at two traits. We're looking at corn color, yellow or blue, and corn shape, wrinkled around in this case, all right? So possible phenotypes, blue and smooth, blue shriveled, blue smooth, or blue yellow shriveled, okay? And the shriveled is that wrinkled up little appearance that you see on the ear of corn. So those are the possible phenotypes, the outward appearance, that's what you see, okay? How many degrees of freedom if you had four possible phenotypes? So don't forget, degrees of freedom is taking a number of outcomes and subtracting one. So in that case, possible outcomes is gonna be four, and you subtract one, you end up with three degrees of freedom. So when we actually do this calculation, uh, and if these traits are independent of each other, okay, uh, and, and that's one of the, one of the uh, Mendelian traits that we're looking at. One of the characteristics of are the traits passed from one generation to the next together? Or are they independently inherited? And to do that, uh, we look at something called uh, the probabilities that, occur, that these occurring uh, independently, it's multiplied together. So when we look at that, it's probability of, of, of uh, independent occurrence. So when we look at blue and smooth, we look at there's three to three quarters of, of them should be uh, blue, three quarters of them should be smooth when you're looking at that probability. You're multiplying those together. So we should have nine out of 16, uh, when we're looking at a dihybrid cross, come out as blue smooth. That's the both dominant trait, okay? If we look at blue and shriveled, which blue is the dominant and shriveled is the recessive trait, we're looking at the same thing. Three fourths should be uh, blue, one-fourth should be shriveled. When we multiply those together, we end up getting three out of 16. When we look at the other phenotype of yellow and smooth, yellow is the recessive allele, smooth is the, is the dominant allele. Uh, we look at that as one-fourth and, and multiplying that by three-fourths, we get the three-sixteenths. So what we're doing here real quickly is looking at what the probability of these uh, phenotypes are in a dihybrid cross. And the last one is gonna be both the recessive alleles. So yellow and shriveled are the recessive traits, and that's one, four, one quarter times one quarter, is that's one, it's one out of 16. So when we look at this, this is getting us our ratio of what we would expect in a dihybrid cross. So we're gonna count 100 kernels, keeping track of how many are blue and how many are yellow, and how many are shriveled, and how many are smooth, okay? Now when you look at this, the ratio, if we counted 100, okay, the expected ratio would be 56, 19, 10, 19, and six. And those are whole number ratios that would be expected from 100, okay? Rounded up decimals, okay? So those are our expected values. If we actually did the count, and this is what we got, we would end up with, so here's our count, and this is, these are the numbers we get. 55, 12, 28, and five. So now our question is very simple. Are our observed values, 55, 12, 28, and five, are they the same? Are they close enough to a nine to three to three to one ratio that's, that, that we would expect? So we're gonna essentially put these four phenotypes into a chi-square equation. Pretty simple to do since we have summation of, so we'll put chi-square for each one of those phenotypes and adding all those together. So when we do that, it's pretty simple. We put the uh, smooth and blue, we've got the shriveled, blue and shriveled, we've got the yellow and smooth, and we've got the yellow and shriveled. When we add all those up together, we get a value that looks like this. When we round and reduce, do a little math, math magic we'll call it, 
and we add all those up and this is the value we get. When we get the decimals added, we get a total chi-squared value of 7.188. So that's our calculated value of chi-square. Now we've got to compare that to our tabled value of chi-square to determine is this a statistically significant difference or is there no difference, meaning that our numbers we obtained are in the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that's expected. So when we look at that, we look at our table, we've got 3 degrees of freedom, we've already calculated that. So when we go on 3 degrees of freedom, we're trying to find where our number would fit. Where does 7.188 fit? Well, it's going to fit between here. This is the 0.05 level. So it's easy, it has to either be hitting this number or greater than this number to be considered st statistically significantly different. So this is not, this is actually a, a less value. So we're on this side of the critical cut value, which means that we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means we are going to accept the null hypothesis that there is no significant difference between the values we obtained and the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that we expected. Why? Why is this important? Well, this is really why we did it. This is introduced by somebody named Gregor Mendel. He looked at single traits on pea plants, and this is the father of genetics. And if you look at his, 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 his contribution to science is, is astronomical, but his significance, he was a monk that lived in a monastery and kept the garden. Well, his significance to the situation is he's a mathematician. He didn't just look at this and say, oh, that's not a 3 to 1, it's a 3.15 to 1. Oh, that's a 2.96 to 1. That's, these, these are not all 3 to 1 perfectly, are they? He used chi-square to determine that these are all close enough to a 3 to 1 ratio to be accepted as a 3 to 1 ratio. Hence, we come up with the, the genetic terms of, of uh, dominance and recessive being 3 to 1 ratio, dihybrid cross being a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. All this is based on some of that mathematical material that, that uh, uh, Mendel came up with. And that is uh, a quick introduction to introducing some statistics and genetics into your classroom. Thank you.